Molo Sanbonani, hello, how's it? Shalom, welcome back to another episode of Blacks Only. I'm your favorite fat boy, Big Daddy Liberty. Guys, welcome back to the show. This is the show, of course, that makes fun of society's obsession with things like race and gender and all these other weird things that are aesthetic and supposed to be our identity. But as she says, the real diversity that matters is intellectual diversity. The idea that you can have a panel that has racially only black people on it, but all of us are different. We all hold different nuances and different ways of thinking about things. Blacks only brings out that exact, um, or the, the importance rather, of that diversity over any other diversity. It's intellectual diversity that matters. Guys, I have a cracker of a show. Remember, we're going to chat for the next 20 minutes about current affairs, the things that really matter to South Africans. And this week is no different. I've uh, I'm in a, a, perhaps as you can tell, a different place um, and not in the studio, but that's because I'm in Cape Town. And in Cape Town, you have those cool Cape liberals who I'm going to introduce to you now. Um, in studio with me, I've got uh, Miss Unati Kwaza, who is, of course, a entrepreneur and a, um, a very popular voice on social media uh, out here in Cape Town. Unazi, Unati, how are you doing? All right, how are you? Fantastic. Welcome to the show. And of course, another face who you guys are quite familiar with is been on the show before. If you go back into the other episodes, um, we have, of course, Mr. Neo Mkwane. Neo is a popular voice down here, ardent liberal who's actually involved in party politics and even in government. Neo, welcome. How are you doing? Thank you. I'm doing great. Excellent. Guys, let's have this chat. Um, it's been an interesting week, and I think it's been a week in which... Um, We've seen some really interesting things develop, um, but let me not talk about the week that was. This episode, I actually want to look forward a bit. Um, this obviously will come out on a Monday, and in, on Thursday, in a few days from now, will be the State of the Nation addressed by the President. Now, there's a headline in the, in the papers today, uh, the Sunday paper, saying South Africans are... Um, are cynical of the State of the Nation address. And what we were discussing just off air now was, I don't think that South Africans are cynical per se, it's just maybe they're weary, they're tired of the same old promises from politicians. Now, let me perhaps begin with you. Are you expecting something special to come out of this State of the Nation address, something that will galvanize you as a South African? Uh, not at all. <laughs> I think um, what we have witnessed from uh, President Ramaphosa for the last uh, two of his uh, State of the Nation addresses will, will be no different in this instance. Um, he's clearly a man who's um, uh, under arrest by his own political party mm -hmm. and uh, the internal party dynamics to that extent. So. I don't expect much bold and decisive leadership out of him. Uh, some. Um, uh, uh, cutting edge moves that he's going to make, um, I really don't expect much. There's the country's in crisis, we have uh, rolling blackouts, and we have quite a number of issues that we are facing, and mm -hmm. our economy is contracting. And this needs some really, really bold leadership. And mm -hmm. I don't think that we've been getting it from Cyril Ramaphosa over the last two years, and uh, this sonar will definitely be no different, in my opinion. Unati, um, you know, Neo makes the point that there is a sore need for leadership and he doesn't think we'll get it here. But some ANC cater might listen to this and say, but hang on, um, Ramaphosa is, is leadership chief. Uh, you just need to hold on. It's a matter of time uh, and he'll show us uh, real leadership. Do you believe a message like that? The question for me is a South African is, um they may say that because he's their president and um, most of these people, um, I mean, have been appointed by the president. So obviously they have to show unity in the ANC that they like to, to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, but the question for me as a South African and as a resident of Kailicha is when the, the president will be telling me that uh, soon the trains will, be, will start running in Kailicha mm -hmm. and Mitchell's Plain. Uh, the question for me uh, uh, as a resident of Kailicha is whether the president has got news that um, the economy will find it, we are seeing some positives in the economy, which is something that we don't see. Um, the question for me as someone who lives in Kailicha is whether the president will be telling me that uh, am I safer now um, in Kailicha than the years before uh, where he also did um, a sauna speech. Mm. So um, as much as people want to be positive and all that, but um, I mean, real life tells a, di a different story for each and every South African. It mm. doesn't matter uh, whether you are a 
politician, you you're in politics or not. Uh, you want to see your family safe. You want to see your family progressing, mm. and that's generally uh, every everyone, whether you white, you black, uh, you Indian, you colored. People want the same things. Mm. We want to progress in life. We want uh, to to be healthy and all that. So those are the things that I want to hear from the president. You, you raised the important issues, and I, mm. that, would, that would have been the next place where I took this conversation, into looking into the speech itself by using key um, areas, healthcare, safety and security, mm. education, etc. Before I go there, let's talk about the president that we do have, right? Now, I know people will talk about how they, there's, a, there's an ideal president that they want to have, mm. but we clearly don't have that guy. So who do we have right now? Um, now, do we have a leader who takes bold decisions and even, at times, We'll, we'll take decisions that disagree with the party position, but because of the practical need of what needs to be done, uh, does those things? Do we have that kind of leadership? And let me use a prime example. We have a problem right now, it's in the news right now, of East South African Airways. The business rescue practitioners come out and they say, look, we need to cut roots um, uh, domestically because they're not money spinners really. Um, they are bleeding the, the, the airline dry. We'll only keep Cape Town, Joburg route, including internationally, we'll cut some routes. Um, and of course, as a next phase, we need to look at actual uh, right sizing or retrenchments. And immediately, who comes out saying, nope, this shouldn't happen uh, because we didn't make representations and blah, 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 is the presidency and um, essentially pockets of government. Do you feel as though we have the sort of leader who can take tough decisions even against his party position, which may be socialist and uh, leftist in nature? Uh, certainly not. And as I've said, and I think the analogy that you, or the example that you've just used right now about the BRPs and the SAA uh, is a perfect example of that. A president who is, who is held back by his own party and segments of it, the union movement, who will not allow him to take the advice that the BRPs are giving to the government to say we need to right size. Mm -hmm. We in actual fact need to review the business plan of, of SAA and try to rescue it. So as a president, I had actually expected him to come out in support of the BRPs because mm -hmm. they have good intentions. To a certain extent, I think Cyril Ramaphosa does have good intentions for the country, but the rubber doesn't hit the road when it comes to his leadership because he he's a man that, that is afraid to take these bold decisions because they have political consequences. Mm -hmm. Now, if he can, if he can assure the nation that he's not so worried about retaining his position um, and, and for it not being under threat at the next NGC or the next Congress, I believe he needs to take bold and decisive uh, decisions and say, you know what, I'm going to turn my back against uh, the recommendations that are made by COSATU. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to put South Africa first and I'm going to put the airline first mm. and I'm going to take the decisions and the recommendations that are provided by the PRPs. But he's not taking that. Yeah. He's not doing that. And that's a concern for me. Unati now makes the point um, that, hey, maybe Cyril Ramaphosa is the kind of guy who has great intentions, right? But he just is hamstrung by one, one or any other reason. But is that enough? Is, is intentions enough when the country is desperate for good outcomes, actual outcomes? Well, um, Neo may say that the president has good intentions, but I don't know what the president's uh, intentions are because if you've watched uh, the, the president the last two years, because he didn't only start beca becoming president um, last day in May after no. the elections. So if you can listen to the messages that he, he's been putting out there, they change depending on who's listening to him, on yeah. who's, who's the audience uh, uh, surrounding him. So that that person, that kind of person, you, you you cannot really say I know this person's intentions. Um, so we really don't know what the president stands for mm. um, as, as people in the country. And um, unfortunately, as Zuma used to say, mm. that. Um, the ANC comes first. It mm. seems to me that even with uh, the current president, the ANC still comes first mm. uh, before the country, which is unfortunate. Guys, let's, let's look at some of the, the, the nuts and bolts, the, the meat and potatoes of the this, SONA, this right? Uh, what we, we think will come out of the State of the Nation address. We know that South Africans, and I've been making this point on the show for quite a while, we know that South Africans are facing threats to their life, liberty, and essentially their property rights. Mm -hmm. And it seems as though, to me, the ANC has become much bolder in expressing those threats as if they're a norm. And you know, even putting them in policy language. What do I mean by this? Well, let's look at some of the things we expect to hear from the president in the State of the Nation address. We know they're going to be pushing the national health insurance, mm -hmm. um, which is essentially the nationalizing of all 
health care under one fund called the National Health Fund, which politicians essentially control and decide who gets health care when and how and why. Um, Unati, put me in the position of someone who lives in Kailicha. And before I ask you to do that, guys, if you want to know what some residents of Cape Town here, including those who live in its townships, had to say about the NHI, there is the link for you to, to watch that. And uh, you'll get to see exactly what people think of a national health insurance and how they want alternatives to that. But um, as someone who lives in Kailicha, tell me about the state of hospitals in your part of the world. Now, some may argue, you know, and maybe Neil might ch chime in here, but oh, well, you know, the Western Cape is run by a different administration. Things are marginally better. But in reality, for, for the guy who lives in some of these poorer neighborhoods, it, it's still the same experience, is it not, of public health care. What do you prefer, public or private health care? Um, if I could afford private health care, I would use it. But um, I, I, luckily for me, I, I don't get sick that often. Mm -hmm. So that's a plus. <laughs> but when I do get sick, um, I, may, I may not have uh, a medical aid, but uh, I, I consult with uh, private uh, health case, uh, carers. Mm. Um, because you have a lot of people, by the way. Yes. Including because people who can't afford it. Even pharmacists, even pharmacies, um, private pharmacy, mm -hmm. uh, just a slight flu, you go to the pharmacy. Um, I mean, I don't have time. I run mm. my own business. Um, I don't have time to go sit in a long queue in hospital. Uh, my mother is, uh, because she has a chronic illness, so oh. she does um, have access, to, she does use uh, public health care because it's cheaper for her to do that. Um, so. What's happening with uh, our clinics? Um, sure, it's uh, a DA-run uh, province, and so we we expect things to be better, mm -hmm. and they are better than other other uh, provinces. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, the last time I was in clinic accompanying my mother, um, there was a lady who um, I met there, and uh, is someone that I know, and uh, she was accompanying her aunt, uh, who was there to take her diabetes uh, medicine. Mm -hmm. She was telling me that um, she only arrived the day before, and. Um, She's from the Eastern Cape, she lives there. But because she was not being taken well taken care of in mm. the Eastern Cape, um, she developed some sores in her body and all mm. that. So she had to come to the clinic in Kailisha to mm. access. So she travels to, from the <coughs> Eastern Cape to Cape Town every time she has to come and collect her medication. Mm. So that's, uh, we are better. Sure, we're not 100% um, because I also have, because my mother uses uh, public health care, I do have my own complaints about mm. how they deal, especially, especially with mental health issues. Mm -hmm. But uh, overall, it's better, but it could be better. Um, and, and perhaps that's the question I want to pose to Nell. Um, on a practical level, I think the Western Cape, and, uh, Better even coming out of my mouth, but I'll, I'll say it. Um, look, the, the DA has done on a governance level a lot of things right, and they themselves have been the loudest voices saying you don't therefore need. If you know what to do on a here and now basis, you don't need this big bulky uh, status apparatus called the National Health Insurance when you're not really getting the basics right. In this case, you know they've been working on getting the basics right. Talk to me therefore about. Um, you know, other parts of this country, will the NHI, the system that I described, suddenly fix that lady who has to leave from the Eastern Cape yeah. and come to the Western Cape? Will, will it create a nirvana of healthcare yeah. in the Eastern Cape to have the NHI? Not at all. And I think you, you hit the, the nail on the head when you said that it's, it's going to be politically controlled. Because if you look at the NHI bill itself, it says that all power, well, most of the power will rest with the minister. Yep. And we all, know, we all know that the ANC is a party that is currently tearing itself uh, apart in so far as political factions are concerned. So what they're doing right now is creating the biggest SOE, which is going to be the NHI, and then whoever is in control of the political inner workings of the ANC will then have access to that particular cookie jar, if I may put it like that. So the NHI for me, it's something that is destined for failure, just because that we, they're not getting the basics right. If you go to the Northwest province, you had certain people in the maternity ward sleeping on the floor. You had people who, there's, there's no bed space, 
you they understaffed the doctors are even leaving and the nhi threatens to see more even more health health care givers uh, uh, flee the country for greener pastures so in my in my opinion the nhi is uh, a disaster waiting to happen there's so many uncertainties within that bill mm -hmm. uh, that uh, i think president ramaphosa will try to, to sort of uh, speak towards in his uh, um, State of the Nation address. Mm. But nonetheless, um, we should not be uh, uh, sort of uh, being, uh, talk even talking about the NHI because it is something that, in my opinion, is, going, is destined for failure. All right, let me move on. So, you know, there are other areas that we care about in South Africa, and safety and security is one of them. Exactly. Do we think, for instance, in the State of the Nation address, that the president can report excellent results when it comes to the fight against crime in this country um, has have the people that he's deployed in positions um, you know that are in the criminal justice cluster being uh, efficient in how they deal with things so let me throw some names out and we'll just have a very brief conversation about that the NPA they appointed a Shamila Batohi I don't know how you want to pronounce that. Um, and ever recently, there's been some articles written to say, hey, lady, your honeymoon is over. I think Adrian Basson wrote a piece around this so, to say your, your honeymoon period is over. Let's start seeing some prosecutions. Exactly. Guys, what do we think? Are we winning the war on crime? Does the president have a good message on that? The president definitely doesn't have a good message on that. I think uh, what we are ex currently experiencing in South Africa is just a deep deterioration of uh, uh, service delivery and across all sectors, across uh, all spheres of government as well. Um, we're just not getting the basics correct. And if you look at the high levels of gender-based violence mm -hmm. that we've been experiencing as a country, the ever-increasing murder rates, mm -hmm. farm attacks, farm murders, this is something that's actually um, uh, at, at reached crisis level. And as a country, we must treat it as that, as mm -hmm. a crisis. And the response from this current government is not that of a crisis. Mm. And that's perhaps where we need to start. We need to be frank about <coughs> these issues. We're a country that has the highest murder rate for any country that's not currently in war. Mm. And therefore, we need to be honest and have honest reflection. And we need the president to come out and say, look, we are under-resourced in terms of policing. We are under-resourced in terms of our our, our law, and, law and order uh, or safety and security aspect and we need to put our money where our mouth is and not only to fight crime through those uh, particular sectors but what, do, what are we doing from a social development perspective. So we, we've been taking money out of these key sectors and we've been putting it in areas which we shouldn't be doing mm. uh, but nonetheless we need some bold and decisive leadership and it boils down to the fact that I don't believe we'll get it. No, uh, um, Unati. Kai Leach is, is the prime example of just how wonderful things are. It's safe and, um, you know, people have, um, you know, you, you can walk around even at 2 a.m. in the morning and not even worry about a rapist or a maga or anything like that. It's perfect, isn't it? Absolutely not. Um, right now with the, with the load shedding, it's even um, another uh, yeah. issue of concern because uh, when there's load shedding, for instance, last night we, we, we had hours at 10 at night. And um, those are usually times that uh, people are out um, jolling and um, at taverns and places of enjoyment for themselves. But uh, because with load shedding, it becomes dark every way. I mean, there's no street lights, there's nothing like that. Mm -hmm. So it, it becomes another area of uh, safety concern mm -hmm. that um, load shedding happens as, at this time. And we know that crime rates in Kailisha mm -hmm. or Nyanga or Kuguletu are quite high. Um, and there's also in the new, there's been in the news uh, stories about vigilantism in mm -hmm. Limpopo. I don't know if uh, uh, you guys have been following that, and it's been concerning to me because mm -hmm. Kailicha also had a problem with vigilantism a few years ago. That's right. That's when um, Helen Zile started uh, that commission mm -hmm. of uh, uh, an, an inquiry into policing in the because uh, NGOs and uh, people at large were complaining that police. Uh, we're not responding to them. Mm, and right. I mean, a crime would happen in this street and uh, a few feet from the police station. And when you call them, they're not, not, they're not there. Mm -hmm. So, or they're not even picking up the phone. So that was when um, vigilantism started. Mm. So when I start now hearing news about vigilantism again um, in Limbopo, I, I start getting concerned. Um, people 
have, have uh, given up on uh, res res life. I mean, expecting police to keep them safe, Absolutely. and they are choosing to take uh, uh, the law into their own it, hands. It's funny you mention this. We've spoken about this in some of the vlogs I do on the show. It's this idea of what's called the Pelian principle. Um, in a free society, in a functional society, citizens have to consent to mm -hmm. the police policing them. Why? Because that relationship is based on trust mm -hmm. and the idea of that, you know, the, these people who we, we, we give the monopoly on violence mm -hmm. are tasked with dealing with the issues that we deal with, or we, we, the, the crime, sorry, that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And we see that element being lost in South Africa where people just say, why well, wait for the police when I can just take the law into my own hands, which mm. you then see a commensurate um, breakdown in the rule of law. Guys, we're going to take a very quick break, and when we come back, we're going to look at a very key area, the elephant in the room, when it comes to the issue of what to expect from the president in the Sona, and really, um, you know, this country and its unemployment rate. Guys, welcome back. As we came back, I, sh I showed you a clip, a recent clip of um, uh, residents in Gauteng attacking a metro cop, uh, you know, <laughs> who tried to do a stop in the taxi they're in. Again, this idea that the public would rather take the side of uh, a, a guy who I'm assuming may have broken the law, may have been a traffic infringement, um, as opposed to the police, because there's just a, a lack of trust in the police. Guys, I want to pick up on this conversation just to wrap it up. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, policing is a big issue, because when the individual tries to take control of their safety, and I'm going to be specific here with my particular passion of gun ownership, you then have a minister of police in this country who says, no, 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 no. Citizens and individuals in this country should not own guns. All the guns should be in the hands of the police. The very same police that we've just said now, there is a clear lack, of, a breakdown in, um, in trust between the public and them in this country. The very same police, by the way, who are also um, some of you know the biggest um, um, contributors to crime. I mean, the, the Institute of Race Relations put out a the Broken Blue Line report. I'll put a link to it somewhere up here so you can read it, which basically showed that a lot of criminality is also caused um, by the police themselves. Now, on the issue of the individual families taking charge of their own safety and really communities, um, is it the... Is it right for a minister in a country like South Africa to say, no, I'm going to take gun control and or rather I'm going to take uh, gun ownership away from individuals and families and rest all of that into the hands of the state? Is it a good move? It's a terrible move. <laughs> and uh, actually it amounts to um, an assault on our personal individual rights mm -hmm. and what we want to do as, as, <coughs> as, as, as a people in South Africa. Um, I, I was uh, completely blown out, out of the water when the minister uh, said that he wants to do that, particularly because as a Western Cape resident, we know that there's huge amounts of police under-resourcing in mm -hmm. this province, and we think it might possibly even be uh, politically motivated. This is the only province that's not run by the ANC. And you look at um, uh, quite a, a low levels of staff complement in terms of the police in this province. So in that instance, private citizens who have been deemed fit to do so must be afforded the opportunity to have their own firearms and to protect themselves in times of danger. This mm. is uh, a, a personal decision that a, a person can take to ensure that their own safety is guaranteed. And in this instance, the police cannot guarantee our individual safety. Guys, which moves me to the next area and the last area we'll look at. Um, where there is a big conflict right now between the individual and the state, um, and the state actually taking very active steps to crush the individual mm -hmm. who takes charge of their own life. And that's on the issue of jobs in this country and entrepreneurship. Now, who we are speaking about this uh, just off air, um, about a, a young chap, Dumeleng, in Johannesburg, um, at Sandwich King. Mm -hmm. I'll put that on the screen, because <laughs> the story is very amazing. Like, it's... it's 
It is the story of the young South African who recognizes that jobs will not, will not fall out of the sky and that we need to take charge of our own lives. This chap, um, a young chap, mid-twenties, um, has a baby and recognizes that, look, I need to do something, man, to, to look after my child. I, I, I have no other options. And with his last 800 rand, he starts the sandwich business, um, you know, sort of uh, creating these quality sandwiches, properly packed, you know, it's, it's a very professional operation, and <clears throat> stands out of corporate, stand out, stands outside the offices of corporate South Africa, selling sandwiches to, you know, the people who sort of, you know, dash in in the mornings and whatever the case may be. So he's an entrepreneur in every respect, spotted a gap in the market, recognize uh, a need of what those individuals need um, and provides that need in order to provide for himself. This chap just last week, Newell and Unati, had his stock confiscated by the Johannesburg Metropolitan Police, uh, roughed him up and took his stock and that's it. He's now sitting in the cold um, and the business he's been running, uh, which news reports, the business insider, suggested was making him, you know, nearly 20 grand a month, a good income, um, which he works for, by the way. I'm not saying this man is, you know, sitting back and, you know, sipping uh, pina coladas. This guy's a hardworking individual. He now has to grapple with the fact that if he tries to innovate, to work, to actually do something, the state will come in and say, hey, daughter, what are you doing here? I'm confiscating your goods. I'm making life difficult for you. Unati, I'll begin with you because you are an entrepreneur. Do we live in a country that encourages young um, individuals, and mostly black individuals, because the highest unemployed uh, uh, groupings in this country are black youth. Um, are we encouraging young youth in this country to start work uh, for themselves? Simply, I'll tell you, when I, I saw that story, oh, I was busy on that day uh, when it happened. I think it was Friday last week. Um, yeah. And I saw on Twitter, because I've come to know Itumeleng via Twitter, like um, most of us uh, who are, who are um, there, even though I'm not in Johannesburg, but mm -hmm. I know I've seen his sandwiches. Yeah. I like how clean his, his space is and how uh, professional everything looks mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned. And so I got very upset when I saw later in the day that um, first there was that uh, new story on Business Insider mm -hmm. about him and how he enterprised and uh, I mean, made himself an income yeah. and uh, for his family and uh, yeah and no, normal normal people will say that cheers what's a good story absolutely but um look what government does they come with the, their stick um, and their power and they crush uh, a young person who's trying to he's not a criminal exactly. he's trying to earn a living i mean actions like that from the government take us back to yeah. before 1994 absolutely. if you ask exactly. me um, where the state knew everything that, um, I mean, the state told you what to sell, you cannot sell this. Mm. Um, oh, you are in a township. Um, so because um, we are the state, we know better than you, uh, we won't allow you to do this. There's a big problem, isn't there, then, of essentially politicians, the people who don't run businesses, mm. and in most cases have never run a business, seemingly thinking they can control anything and everything about Sorry. the market and not allowing the market itself to open up opportunities for young entrepreneurs to seize upon them. Why is this a problem now? And why should we not trust politicians with sitting upon um, or de deciding on behalf of entrepreneurs what to do and how to trade? Firstly, CK, I, I, I want to be clear. Uh, when I saw uh, Itumeleng's story um, on Twitter as well, I, I, I came to see it. Um, I thought to myself, this amounts to literally a, a slap in the face of the 10.3 million unemployed people in mm -hmm. this country. Because here's a government which has failed dismally over the last 15, 20 years to create a growing economy that create jobs. And now the people are saying we're going to take it upon ourselves mm -hmm. to create our own income so that we could improve the livelihoods of our families. Mm -hmm. And what do they do? They step in and they stop it. So it amounts to a slap in the face. So the, the, again, it goes back to the type of leadership that we have in this country. You have, we have an entrepreneur or the, for, as, as a president, someone who's uh, made a, a, a lot of money in, in his career and, 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 and is, is a business-minded uh, person. Mr. Can I stop Ramaphosa? you there? Yeah. Mm. 
Ramaphosa is not a businessman. He's not. Mm. Ramaphosa <laughs> is the beneficiary of race-based empowerment deals, mm. which require nothing of you other than to say, I'm black, uh, how, and how I want old? to benefit <laughs> racially. And this is perhaps why we exactly. have a problem in this country. Exactly. It's these individuals who don't understand what it is to be an entrepreneur, exactly. what it is to wake up early in the morning, morning. to hustle, exactly. to literally be, you know, save oh. and scrimp and put together your last mm. in order to make something work. And we're giving those people mm. the power to make decisions on behalf of actual entrepreneurs. Mm. Is this not the problem we're facing, uh, Unai? Oh. Oh, sorry, I'll, I'll come yeah. back to you just now. Yeah. No? It's a huge problem. And for me, what I took out from the story of um, Itumeleng and the, and the city of Johannesburg, um, I, I, I started to ask myself, um, I mean, what crime is, mm. is that person, what, what crime has that person done yes. in trying to improve their lives? Um, th th I mean, for me, it goes without saying that these are the people we should be encouraging. These are the people who are, who are not waiting for social grants. That's right. These are the people who wake up every morning and face the elements and uh, try to earn a living. Look at the municipal bylaws mm. and find ways to work with entrepreneurs, mm. find ways to, to, mm. to, to, to speak to street traders. These are reasonable people. Mm. These are people who come from families. They know that that street is, a, is, is where I make an, a, 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 is a livelihood. No, quite good quite people a, break bad laws. Yeah, mm. quite, a lot of, in quite a lot of instances you'll find that the, the, the municipal bylaw was written 15, 20 years Absolutely. ago. Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, and this is again something that we could probably be doing in the liberal space, mm. going to these local governments and start engaging these bylaws and mm. say, well, well, hang on, mm. we need to start changing the way we do things. We need to open up and make space for enterprise and mm. ensure that people, we can't go on like this in a mm. country with such high unemployment yeah. and mm. uncomplain. And, but bring it back bring it back to leadership, and I take back everything I said about Ramaphosa <laughs> after that very convincing uh, argument that you put forward. It goes back to leadership. Mm. We are, in this country, we have leadership that says we want to grow the economy. On one hand, they say we want to grow the economy, we want to make it easier for business. Mm. But every year, South Africa just keeps going further and further behind Absolutely. in terms of business friendliness and ease of business Absolutely. on the list in the world. We, it, we increasingly becoming a country that is very d difficult to do business Absolutely. So we have a government that says one thing but does a totally different thing. Mm -hmm. and, and that is the problem. And uh, just to agree with you, my biggest problem and my takeaway from this is the only people who are doing well in South Africa right now in the poor economic growth and the malaise that we're in are the tenderpreneur mm. and essentially the politician he feeds exactly. off of. And it isn't the likes of Abu Untu Mileng and other entrepreneurs who are literally putting bread on their table. Mm. Excuse the pun because he literally says sandwiches. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it isn't that chap who's doing the winning. The people who are doing the winning right now are the people who write the restrictive laws and, the, and essentially create the kleptocracy that looks after politicians and their friends and not um, the citizens. Guys, I must wrap it up, I must wrap it up, I must wrap it up. Yeah. How do the people find you on social media? Uh, let's begin with you, Neil. I'm very active on Twitter, at RealNeoM. I must uh, warn that I do not have any filters, so I go out <laughs> and tweet my stuff all the time. But yeah, at RealNeoM, mm. and yeah. Excellent, mm. I'll put that on Thanks. the screen. And Unati, how do we find you on social media? I'm on Twitter as well, um, Unati Kwaza. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much for your time on the show. I really appreciate it. And thank you, dear viewer, for watching. Again, I've always said this. The show will try and bring you a wide range of faces, ideas, op opinion makers um, from all over the country. And if you want to be on Blacks Only, then, hey, drop me a mail at bdl at thebiglibertyshow.com. Remember, you can support your favorite fat boy by becoming a friend of the IRR. This is exactly where I get my funds to travel and bring you content. How do you do that, you're wondering? Well, find me online by uh, pledging 90 Rand every month at irr.org.za uh, forward slash join. Or hey, if you're old school like me and um, you know this technology stuff is a bit of an issue sometimes, well then SMS us at 32823 and you can pledge your 90 rands there. Terms and conditions to apply. Guys, thank you so much. And remember, never trust a commie. <laughs> <laughs>